really wonderful to see so many people here at the Goldsmiths Theatre and Performance Department's uh, Performance Research Forum. Um, and I am Claire Finborough Delijani, and I'm going to be chairing the session this evening. This is the last session of our term. Um, before I introduce our two guest speakers, um, just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, you will see that the uh, session is captioned. We've put on the live captions. If you want to turn them off, you will see uh, on your screen um, if you have a look on your screen, um, if you click on the three dots where it says more, you can, I think, turn off the uh, transcript, um, but you're welcome to leave it on. Uh, the session is recorded and is then going to be available on the events page of our website. Um, all of your mics are on mute, but at the end of both of the papers, there'll be an opportunity for people to ask questions and you can put those questions in the chat. Um, but you can also, you're very welcome to ask a question yourself, uh, live and direct, in which case, could you just put in the chat that you'd like to ask a question and then we'll call on you. And uh, Katia Hilavara, my colleague, is going to be watching the chat uh, and helping me out with that. And then finally, um, you're very welcome to leave your cameras on. We've chosen a webinar, uh, we've not chosen a webinar, we've chosen this kind of seminar uh, set up so that our speakers can see who they're talking to. So if you'd like to leave your cameras on, that's fine. You can also turn them off. So I'm gonna turn now to our two uh, invited speakers. Um, first of all, Adam Alston is going to be speaking. Um, Adam is our fabulous colleague. He joined us a year ago, poor guy, he joined us in January, lockdown two months later. So we've had very little opportunity to spend time together, but we're really delighted that he uh, joined us last year. Um, Adam is, uh, as well as being a senior lecturer in the Department of Theatre and Performance, he is an HRC Early Career Research Fellow and Principal Investigator on a project for which he won a large grant, and the project is called Staging Decadence, Decadent Theatre in the Long 20th Century. So he's going to be speaking to that project today. And he's also the co-editor of a forthcoming issue of Volupte, the Interdisciplinary Journal of Decadence Studies, and that special issue is going to be on decadence and performance, and it's coming out at the end of this year. And he's working on a forthcoming monograph and it's provisionally titled Decadence, Capitalism and Excess in Contemporary Theatre and that's going to come out in a couple of years time. Previously, you probably know Adam has written Beyond Immersive Theatre, which uh, is about immersive theatre, and he's co-edited Theatre in the Dark with Martin Welton. So um, Adam's paper is entitled Capitalism, Decadence and Excess in Contemporary Theatre. And without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Adam. Thank you. OK, brilliant. Thanks a lot for that really generous uh, introduction, Claire, and also to you, Katia and Misha, for the invitation to present as part of the Performance Research Forum and to join forces a bit with a staging decadence project. Um, the Performance Research Forum has had some really brilliant papers this series, so it's a, it's a real privilege to be part of that and to, to share this panel with Owen as well. I've just put some video links uh, in the chat, um, so just feel free to check them out whenever you want over the course of this paper if you need a visual aid uh, at all. Um, but I want to begin by looking at a form of fan-generated dance in Japan called otage. It's usually performed in synchrony with fellow otaku at J-pop concerts, and otaku means something like uh, super fan or geek uh, in English. And it's a bit like a hyperactive form of cheerleading, centered around the use of glow sticks and a rapid series of swooping and spiraling upper body movements. So it's a bit like uh, an accelerated semaphore uh, performed by a small army of aircraft marshals. 
Uh, while the routines sometimes incorporate jumps, a tage is more usually rooted to the ground with the legs spread apart. It's a stationary, but with the upper torso flailing pendulously in synchrony with other dancers. A tage makes a point of intensifying activity without going anywhere, which I take as a fitting expression of the outmoded injunctions of 21st century capitalism. So for those enabled by its rhythmic patterns, the pace of work and free time can seem as though it's getting faster and more intense. But productivity and growth levels in most so-called advanced capitalist economies are stagnating and they have been for some time, long before the pandemic. And this apparent paradox has given rise to a phenomenon that I like to call frenetic standstill, which I'm adapting uh, from work by Paul Virilio and Hartmut Rosa. Uh, but there's an important difference between our otage dancer and this paradoxical kind of frenetic standstill. Exhausted as they are, these dancers seem to be enjoying it. And I'm not sure that we can say the same thing about our burnt out worker. So I'm interested in what it means to enjoy such an excessive practice. I guess a, a Lacanian might call it jouissance, but what interests me in the staging of excess is more akin to a kind of decadence. I don't necessarily mean this in the sense inherited from European fin de siècle literature, as if the 19th century or a geographical region had a monopoly on how we understand decadent concepts and practices. I mean it in the sense of embodying and enacting an excessive excess, especially with regard to the augmentation of how workers and consumers are disciplined to think, act, and to recognize themselves as productive subjects. So otage is a hypnotic expression of a kind of frenetic standstill, but it's the theatre it went on to inspire that I'm associating with decadence, particularly a form in Japan called ohagi live. Now ohagi is like a sweet and sticky rice cake uh, that can be quite difficult to swallow. Its key progenitor is a theatre maker called Toko no Kaido, whose work I'll be addressing uh, in the second half of this paper after a brief look at some work by Toshiki Okada and Toshiki Okada's company Shellfish, where Okada dwells on the insomniac temporalities of 24-7 economies. The decadence of the excess for Nakaido stages amplifies experiences of saturation and synchronicity, centering our otage dancer in a messy cacophony that eludes straightforward appraisal. So I'll be focusing on how the friction between different modalities of decadence speaks to the attribution of cultural value, especially in the aftermath of crises, like the one that followed Japan's economic crash in 1991. I'm especially interested in the relationships between decadence and productivism which theorists like Jean Baudrillard and Kathy Weeks describe as a kind of meta-productivity that's pursued for its own sake. Performance makers have been wise to the troubling effects of productivism for some time, with the best examples dwelling on its absurdity and contingency. Okada and Nikaido's work are examples, particularly Nikaido, and decadence gives us a way into understanding its engagement with productivist excess. So one last introductory note, uh, the elephant in the Zoom is the pandemic. It's exacerbated how the tempos of productivism are lived and has exposed their disparities with some areas of the economy intensifying and others coming to a grinding halt. But the paradox of frenetic standstill hasn't just descended upon us. I'm also mindful of political catchphrases like Project Speed, which to those outside of the UK was the name that our government gave to its economic recovery plan in June of last year. Something like Project Speed has been with us for some time though, so surely we do well 
to look at historical precedents when assessing misleading allusions to rocket-fueled recoveries and how people have sought to express rhythmic experiences of contemporary capitalism. Perhaps then we might learn how such metaphors are lived. So I want to begin by considering Toshiki Okada's 2014 performance, Super Premium Soft Double Vanilla Rich, which is set in a 24-7 convenience store. What's most striking is how it expresses frenetic standstill through slowness. Store workers and consumers move in a diazepamic state, oblivious to their own compulsive limbic movements. Nonchalant shoppers kick their feet, hoping to find fulfillment in the release of a newly improved ice cream, only to have their hopes dashed when it doesn't meet expectations, prompting the resignation of a store worker overcome by a crushing sense of responsibility. Panic staff worry about sustaining the metabolism of stock replacement, investing the store with a corporeality that supersedes their own. A proud manager dances his way through the inventory and delights in the redundant standardization of handing over change to customers, only for the new method to be retracted by head office. It's a measured study of over-identification, all set to the hypnotic scales of J.S. Bach. I watched this performance via a temporary live stream that was hosted by Munich Kammerspiel last year during lockdown. And thinking back on it, I'm reminded of what dance scholar André Lepecki describes as the unstoppable motility of modernity. But in this case, we're not presented with the exhaustion of dance so much as a space that houses insomniac choreographies. It also reminds me of an exhibition that was held at London Somerset House just before the first UK lockdown, themed around John Carey's book 24-7 Late Capitalism and the Ends of Sleep. I was especially struck at the time by Douglas Copeland's slogans for the 21st century. What if there was a drug that made you feel more like yourself? Insomnia is bad for business. These are the slogans of Frenetic Standstill's dazed iterations. They run through my head as I recall my own fractured attention when streaming a card as work online, occasionally switching my attention from laptop to phone and back again, for no particular reason. As Mark Fisher puts it, the urge to do so tells us something about, quote, the decadence of the freedoms we enjoy in late, late capitalism, end quote. You can watch what you want whenever you want, provided you've access to the internet. You can have goods from around the world delivered to your door if you can afford them. But these are limited freedoms that sustain an underlying rigidity and the compulsions that go with it. The impression is one of choice. The reality is commodified desire. Reflecting on Fisher's comment again now, I'm mindful that I have access to a greater range of choices than those who process and deliver the tins and packages on the shelves in a card store. Also, if there's a decadence to this in a really reductive sense of that term, it's that the materials that go into making these goods, the plastics, the cans, the food, have been shipped multiple times to and from different corners of the planet. It makes me think of Sarah Sharma's really brilliant book, In the Meantime, Temporali Temporality and Cultural Politics. I love the way she holds speed theorists to account, addressing how accelerationist theses tend to gloss the fact that their insights are contingent on a chronopolitical distribution of opportunity. The worker soldering microchips in China, scavengers in Vietnam, retrieving precious metals from discarded phones, taxi drivers, stockbrokers, 24 seven shop workers, academics. None of these experience a uniform temporality, but as Sharma puts it, quote, a time particular to the work that produces them, end quote. Okada's choreography studies how 24 seven temporality is embodied and enacted in a line of work that entangles with other manifestations of frenetic standstill, 
supporting those other manifestations, enabling the speedy for whom convenience is oriented, and whose labour, which may be comparatively more useless or bullshit in the late David Graeber's terms, is valorised regardless. Such a slow, almost tranquil performance of unstoppable motility also reminds me that there's something fundamentally wrong with recent studies of social acceleration. Shortly after Alex Williams and Nick Srinczek published their 2013 manifesto for an accelerationist politics, economists like Robert Gordon were diagnosing stagnating growth and deceleration in the world's most advanced capitalist economy, the United States, prompted by flatlining productivity measures, the demise of Moore's law, among other things. Danny Dawling's book, Slow Down, and Ross Douthat's The Decadent Society, both of which were published um, last year, this time last year, between March and May-ish, uh, build on similar evidence, albeit interpreted from different ends of a political spectrum. Also, Okada's convenience store workers aren't disciplined in the same way as the high-flying businessman that John McKenzie studies in his important book, Perform or Else. They're more prone to the kind of auto-exploitation critiqued by the philosopher Byung-Chul Han, in which the interruption of work becomes a hindrance to self-realization. This is important to recognize as the injunctions of productivism aren't just a preserve of a business elite. They cut across sectors and needn't manifest in the pursuit of tangible targets. Where Ocada offers a measured study of over-identification and the somnambulism that frenetic standstill can produce. Toko Nikaido's misrevolutionary idol berserker goes the other way, ramping up turbo capitalist velocities in ways that lead nowhere fast. It's both the title of an initiative that's been running for about seven years, and also tends to form part of the performance titles as well, including Miss Revolutionary Idol Berserker, Noise and Darkness, and Miss Revolutionary Idol Berserker, Extreme Voices. They're all inspired by Otage, and as a reminder, check out the links in the chat if you need a visual aid, and have their dedicated fan base, who can audition to join a rotating cast of professional and non-professional performers, generally ranging between 30 and 50. And various iterations of this have toured internationally, each following the same basic framework. So I attended the Extreme Voices run at the Barbican Centre's Pitt Theatre in London in 2016, which was presented as part of the London International Festival of Theatre. And we were invited to put on Rain Max under the guidance of translator Kyle Seahuga. And given that the seats were covered in plastic wrapping, it was clear that things were going to get messy. Akimi Miyamoto's kaleidoscopic projections covered the whole of the stage area and offered information about the show and warnings about noise and liquid projectiles, although guidance was soon overtaken by strobe-like anime graphics and bubblegum colour washers. Nakaido stormed the stage, sporting a velvet crown, and delivering a spoken tirade at a pace so fast as to elude meaningful translation, before retiring to a tech desk where a barrage of instruction marshaled her team with the occasional punctuation of a whistle. Performers wearing kimonos and clutching parasols traded places with flailing dancers as a stream of idols erupted from the thick of a hyperactively pulsating crowd homogeneously uniformed regardless of gender and each taking a turn over the 45 minute performance to sing along to an accelerated series of J and K-pop anthems. A chorus line chattered snippets of text that were incomprehensible in a cacophonous fast forward simultaneity. Others picked up glow sticks to perform otage routines. Navy swimsuits and traditional headbands a turquoise wig in the style of the iconic virtual idol Hatsune Miku, military fatigues, rainbow-coloured school uniforms and pom-poms were all put on, cast off and thrown into the audience with machinic syncopation. Endless amounts of glitter and confetti rained from the rafters and the audience was compelled to make way for performers as they clambered over seats, all the while dodging sweat, buckets of water, wakame seaweed and viscous tofu. 
And yet, despite these playful assaults, most of us at the end of the night I attended still welcomed an invitation to join the stage and dance as the performers took our seats, enthusiastically applauding our efforts. So it has the semblance of uh, a TV talent show, only performed with hyper-enhanced Genki, which roughly translates as Vicar or Pep. It's of that world, tracing Otage back to its pop idol roots in the TV audition programs that have been popular in Japan since the, since the 1970s. While there was a dip in their popularity in the 90s, it remains an important period in the history of pop idol music, alongside other expressions of cultural political power associated with Cool Japan, which was essentially a nation branding exercise that the government hoped might counterbalance the bursting of Japan's asset bubble in 1999, uh, 1991, sorry, prompting what's been described variously as a protracted malaise or disease that still haunts the economy. Tunku, who is one of J-pop's most influential figures, has this to say about his hand in producing one of the best known idol acts of the time, Morning Masume, who were guaranteed a record deal if they could find a way of selling 50,000 copies of a song that he'd produced himself over five days. Quote, it was just after the bubble burst. Before, men used to spend money on women and vice versa, but afterwards people just spent money on themselves. I just saw a gap in the market and threw a ball right into it. Morning Masume made the audience want to spend money on them, end quote. In other words, the group sprung to life in the wake of economic crisis, and from Tunku's patriarchal and capitalistic perspective, were enabled by a recession that accommodated highly gendered consumerism and the spectacularization of excessively diligent labor. Nakaido's work riffs on this context, but in a scene that she refers to as underground, she's an underground pop idol herself, and Ohagi Live both quotes and explodes the pop idol industry's productivist excesses. For instance, its penchant for cuteness, or kawaii, also pervades Berserker, but in ways that upstage the stylized sincerity of mainstream acts. There's an indexing of meekness and adolescence, which are associated with kawaii, but they're heightened to points of exuberant monstrousness. Teeth chatter, smiles stretch, voices strain, and poses are struck one after another as if watching an accelerated sequence of gifs. There's a little opportunity for recycled kawaii to play into the possessive psychosexual fantasies that have affected other male-dominated otaku communities. And there's no attempt to hide the fact that pop idols serve as interchangeable image commodities. Nikaido's staging of excessively intensified productivity and market saturation is what gives it a decadent flavour. Decadence has multiple connotations and ties into various historical threads in Japan, although one starting point can be found in the Meiji era, which runs from 1868 until 1912, in which the Japanese government cultivated a national imaginary based on enlightened progress and productive endeavour. An important influence of the time was a cultural entrepreneur, Yakuchi Fukuzawa, who condemned what he called useless arts, his shorthand for art and literature, on the basis that they were not pragmatic or socially relevant. And this may well be ringing familiar bell. This kind of utilitarian thinking had a lasting influence on productivist initiatives throughout the 20th century, but it also inspired Japanese writers to embrace decadence and aestheticism as antitheses. As a literature scholar, Ikihu Imano notes, while reacting to the kind of perspective that Fukuzawa represented in the Meiji era, it wasn't until the subsequent Teisho period between 1912 and 1926 that decadent literature came into its own through writers like Junichiro Tanazaki, who was an admirer of Baudelaire and, and Wilde, and whose work opposed the utilitarianism of Japanese modernity. Later examples include Hango Sakakuchi, who was associated with the post-war uh, Buraya or the decadent school, 
And the controversial writer uh, Yukio Mishima is a bit like a Japanese Gabriele D'Annunzio, who helped to shape the development of underground theatre in the 1960s through an eclectic mix of ancient Japanese traditions and European influences, especially Bataille and the Marquis de Sade. The point is that there are multiple histories of decadent writing in Japan. It also has no fixed identity, save for a persistent fascination with the expenditure of energy, be it through work, war or sex. With this in mind, Miss Revolutionary Idol Berserker doesn't simply extend transhistorically a decadent heritage. It's also not a play. Its conventions aren't literary, but choreographic, scenographic, theatrical. But this preoccupation with relationships between decadence and productivism is still relevant, albeit in ways that approach it through the embodied experience of unstoppable motility. This is important as it moves us away from the literary and conceptual, which has tended to steal the limelight in decadence studies, toward encounters with decadence in the flesh. There are alternative histories of decadence as well in the cultural political arena that inform the shock of synchronicity in Nakaido's work. What Douglas Rushkoff um, dubs present shock. I love his name, in fact he's called Rushkoff, uh, addressing this sort of area. Or in Stephen Bertman's formulation, the shock of hyperculture, quote, a society of busy bodies frenetically striving to keep up, end quote. In a similar vein to Dalfort's decadent society, Bertman's conservatism prompts him to look critically at hyperculture's thirst for immediate gratification and undermining of traditional values oriented around work and family. A striking contrast, in other words, with Berserker's, Berserker's embrace of gender fluidity and youthful exuberance. Bertman and Dalfort's di distaste for the so-called decadence of the young resonates with perspectives that were popular among neoconservatives when otaku subculture was thriving before and after the 1991 economic crash. Like decadence, the otaku label has a derogatory edge. Socially disenchanted otaku neither conformed with nor accepted conventions and expectations based around work and family, prompting older critics to condemn them as symptoms of societal decline and degeneracy. This needs to be understood in the context of a moral panic that was developing in response to well-publicized reports of violent crimes, promiscuity, and prostitution among teenagers. Attitudes toward their excessive consumption also need to be read in light of resurgent nationalist sentiment that was producing what Maradin Ivey describes as, quote, virulent critiques of consumerist hedonism and the decadence of wealth, end quote. Finally, the otaku's rejection of the salaryman ideal, which still plays an important role in Japanese patriarchal hierarchies, although to a lesser extent than it did, was seen to threaten the realism of productivism and the security of those who subscribe to it. The perceived decadence of recessionary Japan was consequently enfolded into nationalistic, conservative and patriarchal narratives that sought scapegoats for economic turbulence in the thick of an ascendant culture war. Nikaido's staging of excess reacts to these narratives by augmenting what cultural critic Akira Asada calls infantile capitalism, which describes a, quote, frenzied capitalism, end quote, that fetishizes adolescence. According to Nikaido, the school-issued swimsuits and rainbow-coloured uniforms worn by her mixed-gender performers reflect this aspect of Japanese culture, and you can find an interview with um, Toko Nakaido on the Staging Decadence blog as well. But they also reframe its more problematic aspects and the darker side of some otaku subcultures, like the popularity of Lulisa imagery in fashion and pornographic manga. There's a little that's sexually suggestive in Berserker, let alone erotic. Rather, it enlivens a spirit of play. It's an excessively useless art of the sensorium that amplifies productivism to points of ecstatic superfluity. 
So this comes with uh, a few caveats. The first is that Nikaido still subscribes to productivist principles, both in terms of her own labour and the exertion that she expects of her performers. But it's important to recognise that she's working in a context that still tends to allocate opportunities to male peers, and her authoritarian demands are explicitly staged in ways that send up the excesses of an empowered mammagon, which means mummy monster. The second caveat is that Berserker's embrace of hyperculture adheres to another, more limited sense of decadence as a kind of profligacy. Few of the materials are reusable. Paper projectiles turn to pulp. Single-use confetti sticks to plastic wrapped chairs, which according to one of my interviewees needs, needed to be rewrapped every couple of days. The consigning of each material to obsolescence reflects productivism's hunger for the disposability, but the relationship to that hunger is less one of criticality than capitulation. The third caveat is that it does little to appease audiences less inclined to get involved. As Fisher and others before him have pointed out, the society of the spectacle has long been superseded by a society of co-opted participation that, quote, enjoins us to join in, locking us into a hyper bright instant. There is no continuous time in which shadows can grow, end quote. None of the pensive chiaroscuro vaunted in Tanazaki's decadent aestheticism. Nokaido orchestrates just such a hyper bright instant, and it's the audience who are enjoined to join in. So the work's politics is as messy as its staging. It reflects the static realism of productivism, spinning on its own axis, and gives the impression that those caught in its slipstreams must continually improvise, despite the choreography being thoroughly mapped out. But its choreographed chaos is what I find so appealing in its staging of frenetic standstill. It reveals the absurdity of a logic that fixates on intensified productivity and the myth of growth as a panacea for capitalism's stagnant realism. Nikaido's performers over-identify with this logic, but a surplus is spewed out the other side. Another paradox, an unproductive productivism that's excessively useless, fun and brazen. So to wrap up, I've been looking at two very different expressions of frenetic standstill, one in which unstoppable motility flows through the compulsions of 24-7 convenience store workers, and one that augments the rhythms and intensities that 21st century capitalism recognises as bases for self-realisation and fulfilment. Also, where Okada's work offers a straightforward or relatively straightforward critique of 24-7 economies, Berserker sits at a cultural-political interface, with decadence serving as a touchstone for thinking through its aesthetic, where some of the more subversive connotations of decadence might be found, as well as the undermining of otaku as decadent threats to conventional productivist values, as you might find in neoconservative discourse, for instance. It's the hyperbolic becoming of project speed, as seen from the perspectives of a generation charged with economic recovery, immersed in cultures that they know are co-opted, while seeking alternatives to the cynicism of embracing it anyway by augmenting its successes and reveling in the wreckage. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Adam. Um, that was really stimulating and highly enjoyable. And um, I'm going to save comments and uh, questions for after Owen's paper. So we're going to move straight on to Owen's paper now. Um, so I'd like to introduce everyone to Owen Parry, Owen G. Parry, who is an artist and also a researcher um, who holds a PhD and Owen works with Adam on the uh, staging de 
decadence project here at Goldsmiths. Um, Adam is a contemporary, uh, works in contemporary theatre and live art and visual and digital processes, as well as being an academic researcher. And he's also a teacher at Central St. Martins. And Adam um, Owen's paper is entitled after trash when underground sex cults become surveillance theatres where do we go so uh i invite you to take the floor owen thank you that's lovely thanks thanks claire and uh thanks adam and everyone um yeah it's lovely to see uh, some people i know as well i wasn't expecting to see faces in the room so actually feel a bit calmer about this now that I can actually see some people. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so just to say um, that, I, yeah, I think there might be some generative crossovers um, <laughs> between uh, our papers, um, Adam, as well, uh, particularly around some things like, uh, you know, speed, but also certain figures like the fan, um, and various other things that come up. So yeah, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion afterwards. Um, I should also say that um, if you have questions as we go along, as this is, I think, a kind of seminar as well, I'm actually very much open. I know I have 30 minutes, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, if they're quick questions, I'm, I'm up for taking them as we go along. Because uh, I've got a presentation. So um, in the sense that I've got, I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> So this might be a little bit more clunky. Um, let's have a look. Right. All right. Can everyone see that? Fab. Okay. My present my presentation this evening <clears throat> looks at how trash, waste, and excess have been taken up as aesthetic methodology in performance for theatres and for screens. From the low budget films of trash cinema and compulsive and anarchic moldy labours of performance art in the 1960s, um, right through to its more recent redeployment as compulsory performance in the productions of selfie celebrities, social media networks, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and digital platforms. In other words, uh, where we not only find ourselves, but also see ourselves right now. The question of place um, and of where in the title of my presentation um, is quite important. Trash, considered by some as, quote, that which has no place, points to its amorphous position within the flows of late capitalism. In these hyper-commoditized, information-saturated and performance-driven conditions, trash travels. Thus, to orientate oneself to the subject of trash might be to also revalue it. And here I'm mindful um, of something uh, theorists of, of, of waste, Gay Hawkins and Stephen Mech, uh, forewarn us about, and that is, quote, converting waste from bad to good using slick theory simply to recuperate the low, end quote. So we might come back to that. Whether one exposes or conceals one's trash or whether one is relegated to the trash heap marks us all dif differently. For Hawkins and Weck, waste, waste management in all its various forms and historical mutations is deeply implicated in the practice of subjectivity. We're always in the process of managing and organizing our shit. I would add to that and say that trash is also deeply implicated in the practice of empire. For the queer and gender non-conforming practitioners who I'm about to discuss, trash is not only incorporated with an intent on revaluing or converting it into something good, it's also taken up as an explosive methodology. Um, a note now on trash and its relationship uh, to decadence. So I want to try and bring some, some maybe crossovers or parallels between these things. Forming as two um, culturally distinct but overlapping concepts, perhaps trash and decadence have similar trajectories in terms of their status as aesthetic inferiority. Um, 
So decadence and trash also pro, um, proliferate in, in urban modernity and, and are in, uh, sorry, intricately entwined with the commodity culture. So as decadent scholar David Weir points out, historically, the accelerated rhythms of modernity, the up-tempo cadence of daily life was for some decadence. For trash scholars like Luis, uh, Jose Luis Pardo, the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of trash. Um, Pardo is replacing here uh, kind of Marxist theories of commodities uh, with a theory of trash. But both we, uh, Weir and Pardo point to the complicated relationship decadence and trash have to modernity, which I want to unpack a little further um, in mapping a shift in the use and status of trash um, across something like the last 50 or 60 years, I guess, or more. But before I do, uh, another note on positionality and on pleasure, this time a more specific, specifically my own relationship to trash. While both trash and decadence form as aesthetic inferiority, there may be some distinctions in approaches to, to both subjects. Um, and I wanna bring in a figure now that has been historically, at least in maybe the European kind of uh, uh, field of research on decadence, this idea of uh, the subject, which is the flaneur, which is often associated with uh, European decadent movements, and which is this cool detached uh, figure. Quite distinct, um, I want to say, from the trash enthusiast who aligns themselves uh, more as the kind of geek, uh, geek uh, but also um, as more of a, a kind of feminine or even uh, queer uh, subject. So I want to say that to study trash is also generally to be a fan of trash. Um, and I want to say something now about, uh, yeah, what, what this kind of means in approaching the subject. So Catherine Grant, who's also a um, uh, based at Goldsmiths in the Fine Art Department, um, has written an article called Fans of Feminism Exploring the Art Historian as Fan. Um, and Grant posits that the fan as an excessive reader. She writes, rather than an, an appropriation strategy that privileges irony and distance, the action of the fan focuses on attachment and desire. Given Trash's relationship to popular fandom and fan being a trashy figure in some ways itself, it makes sense that media studies has been the field that has explored Trash. Uh, and that's where I'm gonna turn now <clears throat> with my first example from Trash Cinema. So um, a lot of you I'm sure will be familiar uh, with this figure, um, Divine, who features in uh, John Waters' films. Uh, and particularly uh, the film uh, Pink Flamingos. So Waters' more commercial success, successes include the musical Hairspray, as well as being a celebrated author and visual artist and self-defined pulp of trash. Pink Flamingo stars countercultural drag queen Divine, who plays a character of Babs Johnson, who lives in a caravan with her mad hippie son Crackers and her mother Mama Edie who compete for the role of the filthiest people alive. With another oddball couple, Connie and Raymond Marble, a rather awful couple who sell heroin to school children and kidnap and impregnate babies to lesbian couples. That's how those. Queer icon Divine is most famous for saying, filth are my politics, filth is my life. And a brief, uh, moment on this slide, which is, of course, um, the most famous scene from the film in which Divine devours um, a stinky dog turd, and which is, in fact, a real life lump of dog shit. One of my all time favorite film and theatre moments is when Divine plays Dawn Devonport in Mortis' Female Trouble. After gloriously entertaining her audience by rubbing slimy wet fish all over her body, 
She then takes to the stage to list all the god awful crimes she's committed, including blowing mass murderer Richard Speck. Divine pulls a gun out and asks her audience, who wants to be famous? Who wants to die for art? And it's not long before an art fan volunteers. I do. A period, a, a, sorry, a parodic expression of the grim absurdity of the art world then, but also perhaps social media today. <clears throat> media theorist Jeffrey Sconce in his classic 95 essay, Trash in the Academy, Trace, Taste, Excess and Emerging Politics of Cinematic Style, develops the notion of paracinema to describe an oeuvre of bad film, including exploitation films, snuff movies, um, and other willful trashy acts. For Scons, paracinema is, quote, less a distinct group of films than a particular reading protocol, a counter aesthetic turned subcultural sensibility devoted to all manner of cultural detritus. Scons sees paracinema as a reaction to Hollywood and the mainstream in movie industry. Following sociologist, sociologist Hans Kanz, he suggests that we understand paracinema through what he calls um, radically opposed taste publics that are nevertheless in, in a common taste culture. Skons also turns to Susan Sontag's uh, famous notes on camp to provide, I think, a rather limiting description of camp. And I quote, uh, as a reading strategy that allowed gay men to rework the Hollywood cinema. While Sconce writes that camp was an, I, I, an I, ironic colonization and cohabitation, paracinema on the other hand, he writes, is an aesthetics of vocal confrontation. Now others such as Mark Yanovich have argued that what Sconce calls paracinema is a species of bourgeois aesthetics, not a challenge to it. And Yankovic's criticism reminds me of something else that um, Zizek says about um, Charles Dickens. Um, he says, the falsity of Dickens lies in the fact that his imaginary identification with the good common people betrays a hidden symbolic identification with the philanthropic gaze of the upper classes who, who don't want their fantasy or social order is merged. End quote. This is also, again, where the importance perhaps of positionality comes in and a shift from the distanced subject to the up close and highly involved fan who will even risk their life or reputation, if only for a good story to tell. What Yankovic's criticism of Camp completely misses, I might add here, is the fact that Camp is less about ironic detachment and perhaps more about a performance of relationality and communion, especially for LGBTQ plus people, but also a Bergen creative class more broadly. Now, I want to move now to my second example to explore a shift from this knowing and ironic appreciation in trash uh, and paracinema, which relies on maintaining uh, the binaries between high and low culture, um, through to trash reemergence as a horizontal universalizing force in the post cinematic media and the Facebookification of art and life. So I'm, I'm interested in what has happened between these two artists' works. No one characterizes this shift more clearly, perhaps, than artist and filmmaker Ryan Tracartin and his epic filmic collaborations with designer Lizzie Fitch. We want to turn to now. So what I'd like to do now is um, I'm just going to drop a link into the chat. So we're going to just, it's a two minute short clip. Um, that you can look at. So just make sure that your, um, your sound is, audio is off, I guess.
Okay, I've just, just finished up, I think. Um, <clears throat> so I'll continue. Influenced by global technologies that reach across nations, politics, art forms at the click of a mouse. The artwork is difficult to discuss in its ever shifting terrain. Representations are staged and disposed of in a manner that brings our attention to the process of their becomings. Fragmented characterizations are placed besides one another in works with little space to rel relate and unrelate, to identify and disidentify. The tempo of the work is fast and in your face, the rhythm haunting and exquisite. There is no single narrative, only an overwhelming surge of multiple narratives all happening at once. It's not so much that Trocartin's work is difficult to be with, but rather that it's difficult to read or to deconstruct as it moves so fast. As a shift from the trashy criticisms in Paris cinema, Trocartin's work operates on the register of affect, producing what we might call a series of trashy becomings. On first encountering Trocartin's work on YouTube in around 2009, I remember having this overwhelming feeling of seeing something that I had never seen before, but that yet it also felt familiar. So not that it completely lacked um, any reference, there are clear methodological resemblances to the moldy performances of Jack Smith in the 60s and 70s and his incorporation of an array of lucid, flamboyant and trashy characters, but that it opened on out with another level of frequency. While alluring me in with its distorted reflections, cracked representations and visions of things past and future, the speed of Trocartin's work ensures that no lingering or contemplating is done and that the now is never quite experienced. While becoming one of the most successful artists to emerge in the last decade, um, um, Drakartin's work is also distributed across YouTube and the internet. Um, I would go as far as to say that Drakartin, um, that there is uh, an art before Drakartin and an art after. I think he's had like a huge impact basically, um, which is probably, you know, as another comparison with Jack Smith, which was kind of the same in, in the emergence of Jack Smith, that there was a work before Jack Smith and work after Jack Smith. Trocartin's performances incorporated in, and mock in the networked world draws instead on today's new celebrities, reality stars, YouTubers, exaggerated network selves, you, me, and everyone we know. Of course, Smith's work employed high spectacle at an extremely slow pace, Dominic Johnson, who first introduced me to Smith, and who has written extensively on Smith's work in his book, Glorious Catastrophe, discusses the way Smith deliberately sets himself up to fail by doing things like advertising his exotic and erotic performances in the back pages of a religious newspaper, um, and beginning his film performances hours later than scheduled in order to weed out the crowd and be left with only those fully committed fans. Trocartin's movies, on the other hand, operate on the opposite end of the scale. They move too fast. The high speed tempo and excessive fragmentation of works like Trocartin's Any Ever ensures that the work continually escapes intention, specificity and meaning. Nevertheless, the work still seems to pull me with it. Where it takes me, I do not know, or rather, I am brought to the feeling that there is no single place. It feels a bit like where we are right now in Trocartin's Any Ever. In an essay discussing Trocartin's and Fitch's priority infield, an exhibition of their movies and stadium seating installations, Lisa Ackerville offers a discussion on the work through the lens of Stephen Shaviro's post cinematic media. She writes, by exploiting tropes characteristic of contemporary reality TV and social network insights, Trocartin aesthetically discloses emerging regimes of subjectivity, visuality, and self-expression typical of contemporary media cultures. Akaval calls this the performance of networked selves and goes on to discuss how Trocartin's hyperbolic uh, character and excessive performances traces the mechanisms of neoliberal societies of control. 
She writes, when we do something extreme, ridiculous or self-absorbed, it is precisely then that we post something on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter so that we might be seen ourselves. In other words, according to social media, everyone's in an underground sex cult eating dog turds 24-7, 33 hours a day, 999 days of the week, all of the time. And how do we know? Because we keep posting pictures about it and keep liking them. She continues. <clears throat> the social apparatus corresponding to the network self's flamboyant and exhibitionistic play can be characterized in an inverted panopticon. Now, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to kind of skip through this this bit because uh, I have I have an excessive amount of, of uh, stuff to get through. Um, but people will be will be familiar with this structure, I'm sure. Um, and uh, what Akavel is saying is that so, you know, kind of regimes of social media are uh, inviting subjects to perform their excess. Uh, in so so this idea of you know. Uh, citizens being controlled in as they are in 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 uh, Bentham's Panopticon uh, or the criminals, for example. Uh, she's making the case that it's in social media, the this is kind of inverted, and we're actually you know kind of um, compelled to uh, perform our excess. Um, so, um, Shana Zuboff um, has talked about this um, in a book called Surveillance Capitalism, um, and she writes, um, unilaterally uh, surveillance capitalism claims human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data, although some of these data apply to products or service improvements, the rest are declared as a propriety behavioral surplus fed into advanced manufacturing processes known as machine intelligence and fabricated into prediction products that, anti in that anticipate uh, what you will do now sooner or later. Um, so I'm quite interested in this idea of behavioral surplus here um, and how that is, uh, yeah, being encouraged in, in the current regime. Akavel suggests that rather than policing us to suppress ourselves, such regimes, quote, seek to exploit and exaggerate our aberrant behaviors with products marketed to exploit our most narcissistic microdeviations. In contrast to the disciplined subjects of the modern era, where self-possession, self-control and autonomy were defined in values, subjects of control societies rewarded for their own spectacular consumption, flamboyant display and conspicuous production. Which brings me back to the title of my presentation. After trash, when underground sex cults become surveillance theatres, where do we go? And I want to move towards a close with some directives and thoughts in, in relation also to my own practice. Um, so since completing my PhD on, on trash in 2004, I have come to question um, the significance of trash aesthetics and think of this cultural moment in some ways after trash in the sense that um, both beyond its initial strategic critical use um, in the avant-garde um, and things like trash cinema, but also after it in the sense of kind of following after it and also chasing it. Um, I and many others are not ready to give up on trash and the pleasures it instills as a particularly um, pleasurable sensibility, um, despite its complicated relation uh, to the new regimes of power. It feels important to think together about this and its use and incorporation into our network lives and the prevailing regimes that threaten our fr freedoms, but it equally feels important that we don't lose that pleasure that brought us to trash in the first place. Um, now, uh, can, I, can I just have a check, Claire, how long have I got left? Sorry, I just need to unmute. Uh, um, about five minutes, is that okay? okay? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. 
So, um, <clears throat> so one directive I would say um, is in Tricartin's work is that is the opportunity for art and theatre act as a form of surveillance itself to surveil back to the system that surveils us. Um, in Tricartin's work, I see this as a kind of surveillance back to power by exaggerating the performance of networked selves to the breaking point of abstraction and oblivion. So I'm quite interested in this idea of theatre becoming its own form of surveillance back on the systems that, that surveil it. In my own pr performance practice over the last five years, I've been developing a concept that I've been calling the performance hangout, uh, which has also formed out of my investment as a fan of the works and tra trajectories um, discussed here tonight. So just to say a bit about the performance hangout, um, it entwines music, dance, um, costume, and hanging out. The performance is structured by a four hour score of music, mostly pop music backing tracks and fan made eight bit versions of pop songs and is accompanied by a series of easy pedestrian non-accumulative choreographies and dance routines. The movements are influenced by colloquial dances and YouTube how-to videos. Formally, they look like something between Tai Chi, synchronized swimming and the Macarena. The music, which moves across jangly arcade-ish bubble, bubblegum pop, deep bass and sentimental movie refrains, structures the piece more than anything else. The entire performance takes place on top of a patchwork screen made of trash, cheap plastic rain ponchos, tablecloths, shower curtains, a European Union flag and other colourful fabrics which are gaffer taped together. The screen is lit with theatrical lighting, pinks, oranges and greens, clearly marking the space as distinct from the outer space of the audience. Surrounding the edges of the screen are props, costumes, masks, pound shop items, which the performers use throughout. There is also a transparent pitcher of water with some coins and several 20 pound notes in it. The non-vegetarian kind of um, notes that, yeah, that don't get wet. The picture of water is set on top of two rolls of duct tape underneath which a light shines so the money is visibly suspended in the water. The audience who come and go as they please across four hours sit on cushions and beanbag, dotted around the darkened edges or lounge in a picnic in fashion. There are extension leads with plug sockets made available for audience members to plug in their laptops or change their phones if they wish. The performance charge, sorry, not change. The performance is simultaneously live streamed online. Audiences are encouraged to open a tab and get on with some work or, or come back. And at some time, at some point, a WhatsApp group is also opened in the audience for the audience to chat and hang out from their isolated bean bags. And this performance is pandemic ready in many ways, even, yeah, even, even long before the pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, just to finish up, um, I want to point to some 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 yeah some possible directions um in this idea that uh you know that that surveillance capitalism there is no way out of it or what what we can do or where do we go to come back to that um question in the title and i've got a few points here that i'll just go through which i, I want to leave as possibilities for thinking about other kinds of performance or art um, practices that might use these certain things and might be, uh, yeah, might be possible alternatives. So the idea of live fictioning, <clears throat> which is a game or form of play that activates the collective imagination um, in which trash is crucial, uh, that which holds the potential to be revalued and transformed into something else, a prop or a costume perhaps. Um, alter duration, a set duration, which allows for repetition, a layering of motifs and gestures, density and intensity to, to occur, and the opening of a different space time. Non productivity, a pleasurable performance that can repeat forever and doesn't get better, i.e., the Macarena, 
and autonomous performance that doesn't have to be looked at all the time. Being together, collectivity, hanging out, feeling a sense of relation to other kin, if only temporarily via physical space and or simultaneously online via apps, social, social networks and prosthetics. Ooh, and an open door. Sorry, I have to keep moving my, uh, I can't see the bottom part, sorry. An open door, multiple tabs and the freedom to come and go as you like. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Owen, for a paper that <clears throat> acts as a really beautiful companion piece to Adam's. Um, what I suggest that we do now is um, it's basically half past seven. So at 25 to eight, so in five minutes time, if people come back, so you're welcome to go and get a glass of something or a cup of tea, stretch your legs and think of a question. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can either just put in the chat, please can I ask a question? Or you can put your question in the chat if you'd rather that I read it out. So um, see you in five.
for Nick. Okay, right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you had a nice little break. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to thank Adam and Owen again. And uh, you've given us the um, exciting and tantalising taste of what the Decadence Research Centre at uh, Goldsmiths is, is up to. Um, so, we have a question. I just want to make sure that I don't uh, that I catch all of the questions. Here we are. Okay, so speaking of Irene, um, Irene says, and Irene, I will. Um, I'm going to ask your question because you put it in the chat, but you're very welcome to um, put your um, microphone on and intervene as well. In fact, I say you're very welcome to put your microphone on. But that's a good, actually, I don't know if I It's can do possible, that. yes. Oh, yes, You've I've, just done, we are. I've done it. One. Yes. So, yes, absolutely. I've just unmuted you. Irene, do you want to, would you like to ask your question? Sure. I'm on my own in my flat. I was going to say in my little flat, but it's not very little. I've just moved to a bigger flat in my beautiful flat in Hackney Wick. And I have been on my own for quite a while. And I... I'm dying to be part of or foreground or establish an underground sex cult. So in this moment in time, is that still possible? Because I think there is a lot of hope there in Owen's points about how can we still, where do we go from here? And I think this applies to this particular moment now. So um, this is my question. How do we do that? Um, yeah, okay, I can say something to that, I guess. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, this, uh, the question in, in the title of my paper, and also your question, Irene, is, is really about uh, a larger question around, I guess, uh, collectivity uh, being together, um, and the impossibilities of that right now. But also, um, I think, particularly, the idea of um, the underground or what that was or what that might be, right, um, has shifted in many ways. Um, and I'm interested in how that, that in this shift in status that I was trying to show in, in terms of, you know, the depiction of those things in from Trash Cinema to, to uh, Trocartin's work, which is closer to where we're at right now. Um, whether things like pleasure can still exist. Um, so I don't have an answer to the question specifically, but I think, um, yeah, the question of pleasure, and I think for me, it can exist through, some, through something related to, um, I think, rhythm. And um, that came up also in Adam's paper, um, the idea of rhythmic experience of capitalism, but I think in, in both the work that I was looking at and also the work that Adam's looking at, there's something about rhythm that also can connect us perhaps when we're not able to be in the same place. Um, but I won't say anything more <laughs> than that for now. Adam, did you want to say anything in response to how to form a sex, an underground sex cult in the age of COVID-19? Uh, yeah, why not? Um, well, I'm not sure, if I'm being honest, I'm not sure an online underground sex cult is a sex cult I'd want to be part of. Uh, absence makes the heart very fonder. Because uh, when I when I think of underground sex cults online, unfortunately, my mind goes to some really, really dark places. When I think of where the underground and, uh, I guess, a a uh, disturbing form of the erotic might be found at being the dark web. You know, that's that's how I think of the underground of the internet and where sex cults might circulate in the underground of the internet. A very undecadent space, a space of opposition, but a space of opposition that doesn't want to be discovered or that doesn't want to flaunt its oppositionality or to embrace its oppositionality in a mode that is consciously performed as an oppositionality. So that's partly why, if I'm going to pursue an underground sex cult, I'd want it to be in person. 
Okay, thanks to both of you. So we've got some questions coming in here. Um, Nick uh, Wakefield, Nick, you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. Although, hang on, do I need to, un oh no, yeah, you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you. Thanks for both of these papers and to the Goldsmiths team for inviting us all into this. It's nice to be able to join these things when we might, might not have been able to physically join it. Um, I've got a question for both of you uh, that might not be really fully formed yet, but it really comes on the back of that idea of like, where do we go and collectivity. Um, and it's in relation to this idea, I was thinking about uh, in both of these papers, this thing that Bojana Svejic talks about, about how um, kind of cultural labor is, is so often both immaterial, but yet it's also super embodied. And there seems to be this kind of weird tension and confusion at work in the kind of critical potential of how the, the kind of comments or possibilities that are, that are being proposed to these, these works that you're looking at is like, on one hand, really, really real, but also really not real. It has this, it has this strange tension or confusion at its, at its core. Adam, the practices you're talking about really seem to, to point to that excess and not know about whether they were fully critical of it or not. So I'm wondering then about like, who are, the, you know, the, where do we go? Well, like it comes back to the kind of really central questions of who's the we, because it seems like in, in these kinds of uh, collectives that we're actually needing to talk about are collectives of people that are more and more extremely divided by politics and by these kinds of um, processes of, of work that you're talking about, where like the divisions that are created by um, different kinds of embodiment and materiality are actually only being exacerbated by kind of COVID and things. So. You know, Adam, you talked about like being able to afford to buy Amazon stuff. Um, so it's something there. Sorry, that's that's really kind of not fully formed. But I think something about the, um, the the confusion of the collective and what what is the status of the materiality or embodiedness of the collective and how confusion seems to be some kind of a really difficult part of that. Uh, I don't mind going going first of that. So thinking about the, the Japanese context, for instance, in the immediate aftermath of um, the bubble bursting in 1991, the ways in which Japanese playwrights and theatre makers tended to respond to that was through a form of hi hyper-realist dialogue that was associated with what came to be known as um, quiet theatre that people like Oriza Hirata was, was associated with and Toshiki Okada, who was the first of the two theatre makers that I was talking about, was, was very much influenced by that. And some of Toshiki Okada's early work, for instance, Five Days in March, which is one of the most uh, famous that they've made with Shellfish for Company, it, it sort of it mirrored this hyper-realism. The reason why I, I want to mention that chunk of work is because it was quite nihilistic in its assessments of the visceral impact of economic catastrophe and the ways in which sort of Nikaido's work intervenes in that is not a form of pessimism or, or nihilism necessarily. It's to relentlessly insist on the pursuit of pleasure in the direst of circumstances. I wouldn't go so far as to call it uh, as to align it with a form of pleasure activism in the sense of Edwin Marie Brown, for instance. I don't think it, it quite falls into that category. But what I do like about it is uh, it takes fun and pleasure as a starting point for dealing with a state of affairs that is anything other than fun and pleasurable. Um, I also really like the way in which uh, it it both mirrors and seeks to, well, I use this term augment a lot. We could also use the term subvert, but I don't think it's quite doing that. It's, it's a process of exaggeration. That I think it's a lot more interesting in ways that appropriate the notion of excess 
from that which ought to belong to a few, which I think demands that we recalibrate you know, who ideas of excess are for, who is opulence for, um, and the rest of it. So I think that transition from how Japanese theatre makers were dealing with uh, the impact of the 91 um, crash in the 1990s through to how they are dealing with it now is that it's a really, really interesting cultural shift and one that has within it maybe just the smallest kernel of optimism that still gives us something to hold on to. Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I um, I think that what you said, Nick, um, in relation to this shift from something like a critical community or a critical body, uh, and to what Adam said about, um, I think uh, around this idea of them, you know, knowing something isn't necessary for the good or doing something good, but doing it anyway. Um, and I think that's, that's actually something, you know, that is, that is what forms a kind of collective experience in some ways. Um, just in the sense that I'm thinking of, you know, just to think of like very concrete examples of things like, um, I don't know, like the acid <laughs> house movement or like, you know, the rave movements where, people came together you know in the 80s and and danced they didn't do it to be against the government they did it for their pleasure of being there in that kind of sense um and yet it had some quite interesting outcomes in terms of you know occupying spaces and things like that so um that's just to go back to another example but i think that is something something that connects that is about um collectivity and uh, doing it anyway, even if it isn't the right thing to do in some in some ways. The interesting thing about both those examples, the Acid House and also the UK rave scenes, um, particularly with the UK rave scene, with the you know the banning of um, a repetitive sequence of beats and so on, is the time when these things would take place. Often after midnight, a time that doesn't fit the temporalities of productivism, a time that doesn't fit the temporalities of daily labour. Uh, that pushes up against it and that produces frustration as a consequence of it. So I think it's really, really interesting um, example to draw on there. And actually a, a, an unusual figure who's been popping up in ways that I think really speak to decadence and really speak to some of the queer context that you were touching on, Owen, is, is um, DJ Sprinkles. Um, and uh, thanks to Angel Rose, who's um, going to be talking in a uh, uh, a seminar tomorrow that you can find out about on the Staging Decadence website drew my attention to a YouTube vlogger called ContraPoints who um, references DJ Sprinkles a bit in her exam um, examination of, of, uh, of opulence uh, but specifically citing DJ Sprinkles and um, the evolution of house music and that sort of thing and disco and disco fever or disco mania. There's all sorts of things swimming around there that I think are super interesting and relevant to some of the things, um, particularly you were talking about Owen in your, in your talk, what um, was fascinating. Um, okay, well, I'm particularly delighted to see that we have some students here this evening and I'm going to hand over to Lewis now if you'd like to ask a question. I, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Owen and Adam. It was super um, interesting and fascinating to listen to you. I've just been reflecting uh, on some of the things you were saying, um, and there seems that there's this strange paradox where when you think of sort of opulence, decadence, this kind of higher kind of uh, excess, you think of like the top 1% and you see that, and then trash kind of undercuts that, um, which is kind of what you were speaking about. So my question very simply was, um, why do we think that sort of trash, camp, excess, opulence is so appealing to a queer community that perhaps isn't so sort of rooted in that 1% sort of high capitalism thing? So I suppose mainly for Owen, but also Adam as, as well. Yeah. So why is, tramp, uh, why is trash so apparent in sort of appealing to queer communities? Yeah. 
Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so uh, it's interesting actually, because the first uh, the first time I I well when I when I first put this paper together, it was for a conference called Queer Trash in Cambridge, run by Dermot Hester, who is. Uh, um, yeah, who is who's had a project project on queer trash and thinking about that relationship to you know uh, the trashing of queer bodies historically, basically, and an identification uh, of queer you know people and queer subjects uh, with trash in the sense of being relegated to trash through you know through normativity and, and various other things. So um, I think that's that's the yeah that's the relationship and i think divine you know the example of divine um is is an icon in relation to that i don't know if that i don't know if that makes yeah if that makes sense or answers what you were questioning i'd probably um go i wasn't expecting to be talking about dj sprinkles tonight but uh, going back to to dj sprinkles they wrote a really, I'm going to put it in the chat, a really great uh, essay, blog post, uh, called Viva McGlam. Um, and there's, there's sort of a few things to say about this. So the first is um, the notion of, of glamour uh, in it, etymologically used to relate to a kind of, a kind of magic. Um, and that, that magic or the spell that glamour can cast is, is in a sense what's been commodified as glamour has uh, transformed or evolved into this highly sterilized, highly polished form that we might associate with, uh, with RuPaul, for instance, um, and that we might distinguish from the kind of, uh, a, a very different kind of subversive or queer opulence we might associate with, with other kinds of performance. And certainly of excess. You know, when uh, we might think of David Hoyle for here, for instance, that it's sort of trying to experiment with modes of appearance that would appear in some form excessive or to index the opulence, but in ways that also warp it. Um, and there, there was an article where David Hoyle self-described as it's, it's something like the doyen of decadence and nihilism. <laughs> And I think that there, there's, that's not, it's not doyen, it's something else, it's something like that. I think there is something in, in David Hoyle's aesthetic, for instance, that we might pitch in opposition to some of the adjectives that you were referencing earlier, that invite us to rethink what they mean and how, how they might be calibrated, opulence being one of them. And that ContraPoints video I mentioned earlier, it begins with, with an assessment of opulence. Um, and why it is a why it could be attractive outside of the hands of the one percent. Just, just, just to add to that, I mean, as you brought the word in glamour in as well. I mean, J Jack Smith was famous for saying, "Glamorize your messes," um, and in you know through glamorizing your messes, um, there's a there's a kind of revaluation revaluation of that that's happening as well, um, and I think particularly to, you know, in terms of uh, LGBTQ plus queer histories, there is a, also like a, a trauma or a, a kind of healing that happens through that as well. So I think that also connects back to the magic maybe uh, that DJ Sprinkle talks about somehow. There's a question from Sabina. Sabina, um, your former colleague, Adam, who asks where the shift is from modernist decadence to where we are now. I wouldn't say that there is one shift. I think that there's um, a misconception that decadence was at any point monolithic. So uh, references to the decadent movement um, I think are really misleading, spurious even, in the 1890s, the kind of decadence we might associate, for instance, with J.K. Huisman, uh, with Rashilda, with Oscar Wilde. Um, this, this is often framed under the umbrella of this thing called the decadent movement. But I'm quite, I, I guess I want to sort of push back a little bit against that, not only because I find these taxonomies misleading, 
For one thing, the boundaries separating, in inverted commas, naturalism from symbolism from decadence are extremely fuzzy. And artists and writers were quite promiscuous in how they identified themselves and um, the genres and the styles that they were playing with over the course of the 1890s. That's one thing. But secondly, yeah, as I, as I mentioned towards the beginning of the paper, Europe for me doesn't have a monopoly uh, on how we should understand decadence. Uh, we could think of the US context, but we might equally think of a Japanese context too. That yes, bore some kind of relationship to European configurations of decadence, but it was mutually beneficial. For one thing, European decadence was directly inspired by Japanese aesthetics, particularly through world fairs and, and the like. Um, but it, it kind of worked both, both ways. Uh, is it Matthew Potolsky has written a book called The Decadent Republic of Letters that also touches on this a little bit. And um, uh, Regina Gagnier, I think her name is as well, has written on a decadence and globalization. So in terms of where we might pitch a definitive shift um, from I would say decadence into modern modernism or vice versa, modernism into the evolution of decadence. You know, it's, it's, there is no one point that we can locate. It's multifarious. And one other thing that I really want to sort of underscore here a little bit is are the political alignments that decadence has taken. You know, decadence has been embraced by anarchists and it's been embraced by fascists. You know, Gabriele D'Annunzio, his relationships with fascism were, were quite well known um, towards the end of the 19th century, but uh, moving in towards the beginning of the 20th century, sorry. Um, Mussolini feared D'Annunzio, um, given his popularity with, uh, in Italy at the time as, as somebody who could potentially topple him. Um, likewise, in Japan, in the Japanese context, Yukio Mishima was, was um, closely associated with a resurgent breed of nationalism. So I wanted to draw that parallel between those two. So not only do, do we need to distinguish between uh, multiple histories of decadence, we also need to locate how decadence is codified in relation to the polit political positions held by somebody who identifies as being decadent or writing decadent literature or producing decadent art and so on. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Adam. I'm just going to jump in there because I think that's the interesting aspect for me to see how, how decadence as a term sort of, as you say, jumps around or is sort of has um, reverberations in Japan and it comes back in the same way that you were getting at its relationship to capitalism and the longer histories that we, we find sort of resurfacing now also the forgotten, sort of forgotten history of imperialism coming back through. And I was quite interested if, you know, a decadence and performance now also sort of speaks to that moment when at the same time with Owen's paper, the, the idea of surveillance theatre and what would be the, th the power of theatre at a moment where we're mostly performing in a sort of narcissistic engagement with social media aesthetics <laughs> that are actually quite the opposite of what performance of subcultures in the 80s or even the images you showed of things from the 70s that you showed. I was quite interested in, in, in you know, to, and we can, I mean, I think it's too early to say now where we're really gonna go from here, but, but what decadence, you know, to what the relationship in a way is between the decadent movements of the previous century to where we are now and that we're sort of working through. And, and uh, I was thinking about the term recycling as well. Are we recycling some of those concepts or they come back in interesting ways in the same way that we sometimes see those shifts in contemporary post-colonial performances as well, as they've gone through their own histories of capitalism and aesthetically that resurfaces. So, so I thought it was really interesting to think about uh, about that and I guess I would agree with you to say you know that there there isn't a um, sort of finished period that we could call decadent and then that's finished but that it comes back or has a longer history that comes back in contemporary times as well yeah no oh, thanks one more comment sorry <laughs> 
Uh, there's a there's a comment from Ellie Clark, which you I'll just sum up. Um, uh, they say that um, it's interesting how many queer parties have been streamed via Facebook or other platforms over this pandemic, often without any kind of proper consent asked or given. Totally, This totally changes the vibe with no possibility of anonymity, identity switching, um, play in the proper sense, etc., including sex. The party becomes entirely for the camera and the people who literally show up are to camera performers. The other guests become the spectators. Um, so um, that was just, then um, we have, I think this might need to be the last question really, um, which is Julia. Um, who asks um, if you can might be able to comment on opulence in relation to or in tension with or perhaps against the idea of luxury? So actually, do you know what? I'll leave you free to, to, to speak to either or both of those ideas. So Ellie's idea about um, uh, Facebook and other platforms during the pandemic and the this role changing of performers and spectators or fixing of roles as spectators and then this relationship or tension between the terms opulence and luxury. It's, uh, it's difficult to resist not drawing a parallel there with Aaron Bastani's fully automated luxury communism and maybe to ask the question who might luxury be for? Who might opulence be for? Why should either luxury or opulence be the preserve of a few? And if it's to be pluralized, how might that be enacted? And a good forum, a good starting point for envisaging, um, you know, that redistribution of opulence and luxury would seem to be the theater, would seem to be the performance as a prefigurative space for imagining what these forms of opulence and luxury could look like. Um, so yeah, that would be my, that'd be my immediate response. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty interested in, um, Julia, your uh, question as well in relation to opulence uh, and also trash. And I think one of the things that uh, has come to me in relation to trash, maybe more, more than opulence, is that um, I think the reason trash is so appealing, um, even maybe in terms of luxury, is that because of trash's transitoriness, in the sense that it's constantly in a process of uh, being revalued or recycled or going somewhere, um, it's inherently something that is, uh, holds potential always. So in, for example, I, I briefly introduced at the end of my paper, the, the kind of performance hangout that uh, I've been cre creating in my work. Um, the idea of, of kind of luxury then is, is, is kind of clashed together with things like trash there in some ways to, to to create something else and um not yeah I'm not sure what that is yet <laughs> i guess but um i think there is a a tension there or um and that connects also to the idea of uh yeah of of luxury communism um that Adam mentioned um and i think something about the clashing of concepts or, or things like that together creates um yeah, well, create something new and creates a new kind of energy. Uh, and that's usually like an erotics or a pleasure. Um, and I think that is also a form of uh, maybe kind of, yeah, becomes appealing as, as, a, as, a, as a world to come or whatever, if, if we want to go down that route. Um, so there's something there, yeah. Right, okay. Thank you very much to both of you. I think it is time to let you go and have your dinner at five past eight. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming. There are not many good things we can say about this 
topic, but one of them is that um, we've been able to welcome to our performance research forum people who might not have wanted to, to hack over to New Cross at 6.15 on a Tuesday evening. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, but we do hope that next year you might be able to come in person and we can share some cheap wine and conversation with you. Um, so stay well and safe everyone and look after yourselves and until soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.